My name is Alan Dice. I'm one of the pastors here. We are so glad you're here this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings chapter 18 in the Old Testament. I want to also put in a plug for Football Sunday. That is in our Sunday morning service in two weeks from today. It is the, the same Sunday as the big game. We can't actually say the name of the, the big game, but you know what I'm talking about. In, uh, in two weeks, and that is uh, a special, special Football Sunday service here, 9.30, uh, February 3rd. You know, I noticed when I was reading the book of Acts that the Apostle Paul, when he was walking through the city of Athens, he, he was looking at all the idols and all the things that people worshipped in the, in the uh, city of Athens. And he found this idol, this image, that people worship dedicated to an unknown God. And so Paul took that, that idol that was dedicated to an unknown God, and he used that to preach to people about Jesus. And, and so if Paul could take a, an idol and preach to people about Jesus... Why can't we take football and preach to people about Jesus using football? I think, I think just about anything in our culture that people are excited about and pay attention to, we can take those things in our culture and preach to people about Jesus because of them. Don't, don't you agree? So uh, in two weeks, we're going to use football to preach to people about Jesus. So there are lots and lots of these postcards out in the, uh, the back of the auditorium here. So grab them. After a couple of weeks, we'll have to throw them away. So Take a stack of them, hand them out, post them in your uh, workplaces, and, and hand them out in school, and, and we encourage you to uh, invite, invite some friends along. Uh, most of our youth are gone this weekend. Uh, usually that, that section is all, all filled. So we're going to pray for our, our youth this morning. We're going to pray for our neighbors. We're going to pray for salvations here in our, in our neighborhood this year in the name of Jesus. So would you join with me in prayer? today. In the name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. Lord, we are, we are so blessed to come into your kingdom. We are so blessed to come into your family. And, and Lord, today we do pray for salvations in this neighborhood in, in 2019. We pray for people to come to faith in Jesus. We pray for people to, to uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit. We pray for people to be baptized in water in 2019. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we do pray for our, our surrounding region, our surrounding neighborhoods here in the name of Jesus, the surrounding towns for Mannheim and Lidditz and all the, all the towns and, and neighborhoods surrounding, surrounding this church building. And Lord, we pray for uh, a move of God. We pray for revival in our, in our region, in our neighborhoods, Lord. We pray for revival in the, in the surrounding churches here. And Lord, we, we do bless and, and stand with and pray for the churches in this in this neighborhood, Lord, we bless Herb Mennonite Church. We bless Trinity Baptist Church. We bless Speedwell Heights Brethren in Christ Church. We bless Jerusalem Church, Lord. We bless St. Paul's Lutheran Church and White Oak Church of the Brethren and White Oak Mennonite Church. And Lord, just all the the churches, the leaders, the pastors, the ministries around here in this area, Lord, we bless them today. We pray that the the fire of God would fill those those churches and ministries, and and that many people would be saved because of. Uh, your work in, in people's lives through this time, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the way we see you at work in our lives and in our neighborhoods. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, today, I'm, I'm kicking off uh, a very short series, two, two Sundays, uh, based upon and, and focused on the Holy Spirit. And, and so today's, today's uh, title, you see, on the screen is Holy Spirit, God's Fire Falls. And this comes from a, uh, a story, just like this amazing story in the Old Testament about, about Elijah. And I just want to encourage you, if you're a, if you're a parent of, of young children here this morning, I just want to encourage you to read Bible stories to your children. I mean, I, I'm a graduate of Bible college, but you know what? Most of my Bible knowledge came not from Bible college, most of my Bible knowledge came from when I was four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, when my parents would sit down each night before we went to bed and read Bible stories to us. And so I, I remember these, these stories mostly from, from the Old Testament, New Testament, from those times when I was growing up, and, and from the Bible stories my parents, uh, our, our parents read to us. So I encourage you, 
If you're a parent of young children, read Bible stories to your children. This amazing story points forward from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And we'll, we'll see how that works in a minute. We're here in, in 1 Kings chapter 18, and, and many of you know the story of the Israelites, how, how the Israelites were, were uh, slaves in Egypt, and, and God brings them out of Egypt with uh, tremendous supernatural miracles. And, and God's people travel for 40, 40 years in the desert. They see amazing miracles as God leads them. God provides for their needs out in the middle of the desert. God provided enough water for like over a million people plus all their cattle. He provided food for them, enough to eat uh, all, they, all they needed to eat. He provided um, so that their, the Bible says that their clothes didn't wear out. I, I guess fashions didn't change very much back then because they wore the, the same clothes all the way through their, their trip in the, uh, in the desert. And the Bible says that their sandals didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their sandals didn't wear out. God provided supernaturally in amazing, amazing ways for them. And so they came into the land. They came into the promised land that God, God had promised them, and they, they settled there in the land. And, and eventually, they, they started looking around at all the other people in the land, the, all the other nations. God had warned them, be careful of those other nations because they will lead you astray. And, and guess what? That's exactly what happened. They started looking at all those other ungodly nations around them, and they, they started to, to think, wow, it would be great to be like those other nations. First of all, they have kings, and we don't. So we'd really like to have a king. And, and God warned them through the, his prophets saying, look, if you get a king, he's going he's gonna to take what you have. He's going to impress your young people into his service. He's going to uh, you know, he's going to rule over you. And, and they said, it doesn't matter. We want to be like those un- other nations. We want to have a king. And so God allowed them to, to have kings. And, and throughout their history, many of those kings were, were really horrible people who, who led the nation further astray and, and away from God. Not, so not only did they want a king, but, but secondly, they looked at the other nations around them, and they realized that those other nations were worshiping some other gods that the Israelites didn't have. And, and there in Canaan, which was supposed to be, uh, God called it, the land flowing with milk and honey, it was, a, it was a good, fertile, prosperous land. But those people worshipped other idols uh, that they claimed led to this land being a prosperous land. And, and they, uh, the Israelites see this, and they begin to go into that idol worship. Worshiping idols, worshiping false gods, just like the, the neighboring peoples around them. And God sent prophets to warn them, he, he, uh, to warn them and call them back to him. Most of the prophets were either ignored or laughed at or, or even killed. In the Old Testament, Elijah was one of the, the greatest of these prophets. And, and uh, as the uh, sort of the contention between between uh, idol worshipers and God worshipers came to a head, came to a climax. At God's command, the prophet Elijah declared over the land of Israel that there was going to be a drought. And for three years, there was going to be a complete, complete drought, no rain in the land. And this was God's call to his people, really, to wake up, to come back to their senses, to get rid of their idols and come back to him. And, And God's call and this drought of no rain wasn't God's punishment. It was God's call to come back to me, come back to your, your first love. One of the primary idols that the Canaanites worshipped was the, was the god Baal. And, and I've, I've got a, sort of a, uh, a picture of, of uh, one of these idols that people used to bow down and worship to. Baal was the, the god of fertility, either for people or crops or or animals, if you wanted your family or your farm to grow and prosper and flourish, you prayed to Baal. And, and in his, in his uh, let's see, left, left hand, uh, right hand, I'm sorry, in his right hand, as he's holding up, he's holding up what, what is an image of lightning, like he's the storm god. He's the god of rain. He, he's the god who, who provides for, provides for, uh, people's farms, and, and he's the god of f- fertility. And, and 
the Israelites started to pray to this, to this false god. Notice they, that they never really gave up on worshiping God. They just started adding gods to their repertoire. And they, and they, and they had many gods to pray to now. And so they prayed to the true God. They prayed to Baal. And they had, they had other idols and other, other things and, and, and uh, gods that they worshipped as well. They just added Baal to their, their list of gods. They had one God for, for crises and another God for everyday life of farming and, and crops and cattle. And so when the crops were abundant, there was lots of rain. Baal, the God, was praised and thanked for his abundant rain. Now, it's interesting that God and Elijah didn't just choose a drought of rain by, by chance because a drought struck right at the heart of Baal worship and, and his worshipers. And, and a drought indicated that prayer to this God really was useless and, and meaningless. And so the issue really is who controls the rain? Is it, is it Baal or is it the one true God, Yahweh, Jehovah? So not only was this lack of rain a threat to survival, it was also a sign that, that the Baal, the gods, were, were somehow unhappy. And, and so we come into this story in 1 Kings chapter 18. It, it's the context of this, this contest, this big encounter, this big showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And, and we see at the end, as we're coming to the third year of this drought, that things are getting pretty desperate. And, and so after three years of drought, Elijah calls the entire nation of Israel to Mount Carmel to settle this question once and for all. Who's the real God? And I don't think it was difficult to get the nation of Israel to come out to this showdown, to this contest. The Israelites and their, and their families, I believe, we, we find that they were close to starvation. It was three years. Their crops were failing. Their animals were dying. They literally had no food left. They were desperate. They may have been literally starving. And so when you get desperate, you do whatever you need to do to survive. And if it was coming to this big gathering to, to get things settled, then let's do it. Whatever it takes. Because my family's hungry and, and my crops are dying and my animals are dying and, and my children are crying out for food. We're desperate, and we want to do whatever it takes. So they were eager to come out to Mount Carmel. There was, you know, back in those days, there was no so social safety net. There, there was no government or Red Cross or international aid to help, help suffering people. You were on your own, and, and you took care of yourself, and you, you provided for yourself, and you lived or died. A long drought meant people either starved or they, they moved away somewhere else where there, was, where there was rain. And so Elijah calls the whole nation to this place called Mount Carmel, which uh, a modern-day picture of it today. I don't think in Elijah's time it had that nice macadam road with the yellow paint going down through the middle of it there. But a uh, modern-day picture of, of what Mount Carmel looks like today. So the, the rules for this contest at Mount Carmel were, were really simple. The rules for the contest were the prophets of Baal would pray to their God and Elijah would pray to Jehovah, the Lord God. And, and a burned offering in those days, and, and so whose ever God sent fire down from heaven to burn up the sacrifice was the one true God. So that, they were the rules of the contest. You pray to your God, you pray to your God, and whoever sends down fire from heaven... That's the one true, that's the one we're going to worship. So a burned offering in those days usually meant building up an altar of rocks. So you would take rocks and you would build up, build up a platform, an altar made of rocks, and you would put wood on top of that, dry wood that could burn. And then people would kill an animal and, and put it on top of the wood. So you'd have rocks and then wood and then a dead animal on top of the wood as a burned offering offering of sacrifice to gods or, or to the idols. And an animal sacrifice illustrated people giving up something expensive. 
as a, an act of worship, something of great value as an act of worship to their God. So that's, that's what uh, was meant by these animal sacrifices. The trouble is all the, all the cattle were thin and dying, and, and who knows where they had to go and what they had to pay to find an animal that they could, they could use for their sacrifices. But anyway, the, the rules for the, for the uh, contest were whichever God sends down fire from heaven to burn up the sacrifice was the true God. And so if you read 1 Kings chapters 17 and 18, you begin to get some of the background of the story. The, the Baal prophets have first chance. They have first dibs. And they begin to pray. And time goes on. They begin to pray. And they begin to pray. And they begin to get desperate because nothing's happening. And they, they pray and they pray and they pray. And, and it gets violent. They start actually even cutting themselves and doing all kinds of things to get the attention of their God, Baal. And, and Elijah's sitting there watching. And, and he starts to make suggestions like, oh, you know, maybe Baal uh, can't hear you. Maybe you should yell louder. Maybe he's away on vacation. Maybe, you know, this or that. And, and he actually starts to make fun of them a little bit. And the, and the prophets of Baal just try all day long. They try hard, but nothing happens. And so evening comes, and, and uh, Elijah says, now it's my turn. And so he steps up and rebuilds the broken down altar to God that was there on Mount Carmel. And he killed the animal and laid it on top as a sacrifice. And as a last final touch, he orders that 12 jars of water be dumped over the animal and over the wood and over the altar. I think to ensure that no one later accused him of, of trickery and, and that no one later accused him of, oh, you, you had fire already down inside that wood and, and that's, that's how you got it going. To ensure that, that there was no false accusations whatsoever. And so we come to the story, the scripture, where it says in 1 Kings 18, At the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, and he prays, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. These weren't Elijah's ideas. God was clearly telling him step by step what to do. Answer me. Lord, answer me, that these people may know that you, O oh Lord, are God, and you have turned their hearts back into prayer. And then the Bible says, Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt offering, consumed the wood and the stones and the dust, and licked up the waters in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. You know, the fact that, and, and the story goes on, that, that Elijah continues to pray after this. They, first they kill off all the, the uh, prophets of Baal, and then, and then Elijah continues to pray, and God sends a gigantic rainstorm that, that breaks the drought. And the fact that rain immediately follows the nations turning back to God demonstrates clearly to everyone who was there that God was the one who controlled the weather, and God was the one who controlled the rains, not Baal. And, and not only that, but in this story, God uses fire to, to make a point and to demonstrate himself and to demonstrate his power to the people. You know, we, we usually fear fire. We try to prevent fire or at least keep fire under control. Our houses have, I don't know, smoke alarms. In case of fire, so it can be stopped. But here, God's fire and rain demonstrated and proved God's power and Baal's powerlessness. Because see what the story says. God's fire comes down from heaven and burns up the animal on top burns up the wood, burns up the stones and the rocks. Now, that's some serious fire that can burn up the stones and burn up the rocks, burns up the dirt, burns up the dust around the altar, burns up the water that was in the trench around the altar. And so you get the picture that all that's left 
is this black smoking hole in the ground of where that altar used to be. And God demonstrates his power so dramatically and so tremendously that there could be no question whatsoever, no suspicion, no doubt whatsoever. And the only possible reaction for people was to just fall on their faces on the ground and, and cry out, the Lord, he is God. You know, the fire of God and the demonstration of God's power leads unbelieving people to come to faith in him. People see God's power and they put their faith in God. Now, we, we often see in the Old Testament that natural events like this in the Old Testament point to spiritual events in the New Testament. And so, um, you know, one way of, of seeing that is the Israelites coming out of Egypt and, and walking through, through the Red Sea on dry ground. And, and uh, the New Testament says that, you know, that's a, that's a symbol pointing forward to the New Testament of, of baptism, of going down under the water and coming back out as free people. The Israelites walking through. So, so a physical event in the Old Testament points forward to something new and, and spiritual in, in the New Testament. And I think it's the same way with this story here today. Because this, this fiery contest or showdown on Mount Carmel points forward to something in the New Testament, something that was coming and hadn't happened yet. When God sent down fire from heaven and many people's lives were amazingly, dramatically changed. When in the New Testament did God send down fire onto people? Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they, the, the Christians, the believers, were all together in one place and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Lord gave them utterance, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Here in the New Testament, we see God using fire again as a visual symbol of how he was powerfully filling the Christians with Holy Spirit. The fire got ignited in Acts chapter 2, started the disciples immediately going out and preaching boldly about Jesus. And just like Elijah, the fire of God and demonstration of God's power leads unbelieving people to come to faith in him. In fact, that very day, the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved and became believers in Jesus that day because the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit powerfully and went out and began preaching about Jesus. And it, and it led to this this kindling of this wildfire revival that, that started there on that day of Pentecost and, and began spreading all the way around the Roman Empire and eventually all the way around the, the known world. You know, this was, this was God's plan all along because God had been promising that, that something new was coming, a, a gift from God was coming, but the disciples didn't quite know what that meant or, or what that looked like. Acts chapter 1 while staying with them, he ordered them, Jesus ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So, Number one, Holy Spirit was the gift from the Father that Jesus promised. You know, the uh, Holy uh, uh, Father could have given many gifts to his, to his followers. He could have given many gifts to his disciples. But Holy Spirit was the gift that, that they and we needed the most and need the most today. We desperately need the gift of the Holy Spirit filling us and touching us and changing us on the inside so we can go and and uh, obey in what God calls us to do. 
Number two, Holy Spirit fills every Christian. When you become a Christian, when you believe in Jesus, Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. Part of, uh, one of the three persons of God comes to live inside of you. He, Holy Spirit is God with us. You know, Jesus was, when he was walking around on this earth, was limited by his, his human body. He could only be in one place at a time. And, and Jesus actually never traveled that far in his, in his lifetime. But Holy Spirit can be in every believer. He can be in every place. Holy Spirit is one of the, the Trinity. So we believe in, in one God who is three persons. God the Father, God the Son, who is Jesus, God the Holy Spirit. And the same Holy Spirit who was there at creation, who was there on the day of Pentecost, he comes in and he fills every, every believer today. So when we talk about the presence of God in a church building or in a town or a neighborhood or in a workplace, we're talking about Holy Spirit, the presence of God. Number four, Holy Spirit is all present. We talk about God's presence. We're talking about Holy Spirit because we believe that God the Father and Jesus are, are present now in, in heaven and we believe that Holy Spirit is here this morning, present everywhere. So he can and does fill and inspire and empower believers in, in Europe and Africa and, and America and Asia all at the same time because he is all present and all powerful. And number five, Holy Spirit is at work in each of us personally, in our, in our towns, in our families, in our workplaces. Holy Spirit inspires us, empowers us, pours comfort and wisdom and spiritual gifts into us. He stirs us up and, and speaks to us, guides us. Holy Spirit is the fire of God that's burning inside of us. If you, if you uh, feel like God is calling you and, and, and urging you and, and you're getting enthusiastic to obey God in, in a certain way, that's Holy Spirit speaking to you inside of you. I don't know about you, but there, there have been times in my life that, that I've needed wisdom for something that's coming up. Anyone ever need wisdom? Need wisdom this coming week for something? I do. I, I, I don't know. There, there have been times I just felt, felt weak and, and just didn't feel, uh, I felt powerless. I, I wasn't sure that I had the strength to to do what, what God was calling me to do next. And, and Holy Spirit supplies us with, with the power to do what God calls us to do. Many of us feel like we need guidance for the next steps. Like, I don't know what, what I should do next. I need to choose between this job or this path or this ministry or, or am I going to retire or what school am I going to go to or, or all the things in life that come along. What doctor should I go to? You know, uh, we need guidance in many, many areas of our lives and we, we cry out to Holy Spirit, would you guide us? Because he, he provides guidance for us. Many of us are, are uh, praying for power to do what God asks you to do because sometimes uh, God calls you to do something and I said, well, I can't do that. And of course, on your own power, you can't do that. You need Holy Spirit power inside of you to be able to obey and do what God calls you to do. So how do we, how do we get Holy Spirit. Luke 11 says, all you have to do is ask. Jesus said, I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it's going to be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. What father among you if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We have a good Father in heaven who hears our prayers. And 
The Bible promises that when we ask for Holy Spirit in our lives, the promise is that, that God will give Holy Spirit. And I, I tell you the truth, there are many days, in fact, almost every day, I think I have to ask God, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit today? I need some wisdom. I need some guidance. I need some strength. I need some power in my life. God, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit fresh and new today? Because we have a, a Father in Heaven who loves to give good gifts to His children. Holy Spirit is one of the best gifts possible that He can give us. And, and you can have that gift just by, just by asking your Father in Heaven, and He'll give you Holy Spirit generously in, into your life. So I'd like to stop and, and pray here this morning, and, I, and I'm sensing and feeling like, like many of you uh, are crying out to God for, for something here this morning. Maybe it's for wisdom. Maybe it's for guidance. Maybe it's, it's because you're just, you're just feeling weak and powerless. Maybe it's for healing here this morning. And I just want to begin by, by encouraging you to pray, and then I, I also want to pray over all of you here this morning and maybe those watching by video here today, that, that uh, God would, as we, as we ask and as we uh, address our, our Heavenly Father, we know and we claim that promise in Luke 11 that He will pour out His, His Spirit into us. So Lord, in the name of Jesus, I do, I do begin to pray and claim that promise for each person here today in the name of Jesus. Lord, those who are needing guidance, those who are needing wisdom, those who are uh, perhaps feeling weak and powerless, Lord, those who are uh, needing uh, just a fresh touch from you, Lord. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would begin to, to fill each person fresh and new with your Holy Spirit's power today in the name of Jesus, that you would pour out Holy Spirit wisdom into each one of us, that Holy Spirit uh, presence and and person would... would uh, Fill us in an even more powerful way through this time, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I, I thank you that, that you're a good father. Thank you, Lord, that you, you promise to always supply and, and that you will, you will never say no to your children. So, Lord, today, thank you. Thank you for the promise. Thank you for the gift, the mighty gift of Holy Spirit to come in and, and fill us and touch us and, and use us, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning? We're going to have prayer ministers here to pray with, pray with you today if there's a need in your life that you'd like to receive uh, prayer for. And, and perhaps you, you're not sure in your life if you have ever made that, that choice to follow Jesus. And, and I'd just like to lead you in a prayer this morning that would help you to put your faith and trust in Jesus for the first time. So as we bow your heads, I'd just like to lead you uh, in a prayer this morning if, if you're not sure that you've ever uh, trusted in Jesus or, or you know you'd like to do that for the first time this morning. Would you uh, pray along, perhaps just quietly, in your heart with me this morning. Father, today I believe. I believe you sent Jesus to die for my sins. Today I turn away from all I know to be wrong. And today, I believe in Jesus as my Savior. Please forgive me and help me to live for you. And please give me the gift of Holy Spirit to live in me. Amen. Lord, I bless this church family as we go from here today. Lord, I bless our, our week as we, as we go from here. Lord, I pray that, that we would be even more dependent on Holy Spirit's presence and, and power in our lives. And Lord, that we would often turn to you, our Father, uh, and ask for that, that wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit to fill us and touch us and to, to empower us and give us wisdom and guidance and comfort. Lord, we thank you that we can have such a wonderful, good Father as you. And Lord, we, we worship you today. Lord, would you come and and fill us with your spirit fresh and new. In the name of Jesus. Amen.